So good. Well, I know that we've already covered uh, quite a bit up until this moment, and I just want to go ahead and just continue with what God's doing in our service today by taking us deeper into the Word of God. And if you have a Bible, I want to invite you now to turn with me to Nehemiah. Uh, Chapter 9 is where we're going to be camping out this morning for a few minutes. If you need a Bible, uh, we do have a rack of Bibles in the back that we'd love to bless you with one. If you need one, just put your hand in the air like you just do care, and we would love to bless you with a copy of God's Word today if you need a hard copy. If not, we got it for you on the screen, and we are jumping back into our sermon series. If this is your first time with us here at Walk Church, we, we typically preach through books of the Bible We go a verse at a time. Sometimes it's a chunk at a time. If the context is there, we'll do a whole chapter at a time. We typically move slower than faster, so we've been in Nehemiah for a while. But coming out of our summer set list, which is where we just were at, uh, we revisit the book of Nehemiah here today. And I'm excited to be in the house with you this morning because uh, the past three weeks I've been traveling on vacation slash preaching at different churches. And man, can I just say... There's nothing like home. Amen? There's nothing like this church right here, our house, the Walk Church family. You, um, uh, as Kelly just shared, we are the church. And just the people here, the spirit in the, the room, the leaders of this church, it's so great to just be, be back here today. So I'm excited to jump into the word with you, as, and I pray that you are as well. If you're ready, say ready. If you're hungry, say, let's eat, let's eat, let's eat. We're going to just read five verses today, look at some different principles that we can pull out of these five verses, and then you can continue on with your awesome Sunday, but that this word would go with you. Not just stay here at the school, uh, but go with you. Amen? Father, speak to us now through your word in Jesus' name. Amen. It says, now on the, the 24th day of this month, People of Israel were assembled with fasting and in sackcloth and with earth on their heads. And the Israelites separated themselves from all foreigners and stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of the fathers, their fathers. Verse 3 says, And they stood up in their place and read from the book of the law of the Lord their God for a quarter of the day. For another quarter of it they made confession and worshiped the Lord their God on on the stairs of the Levites stood Jeshua, Bani, Kadmiel, Shebaniah, Buni, Sherbai, Bani, and Shaniah. And they cried with a loud voice. Don't be laughing at me, y'all. Come on. <laughs> like, you remember what I said. Just, just read them fast, and people think you're spiritual, okay? All right, where were we? Verse 4. And they cried with a loud voice to the Lord their God. Then the Levites, Jeshua, Kadmiel, Bani, Shebaniah, Sherbai, Hodiah, Shebaniah, and... Pethiah, we get to heaven and someone's like, you mispronounced my name, (laughs) said, stand up and bless the Lord your God from everlasting to everlasting. Blessed be your glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and praise. It's really a, a unique moment here in the book of Nehemiah. Um, God is at work in this people. He's at work in this time. He's at work in this season. Friend, actually, he's always at work. Um, It's are we aware of what he's doing? And we see the people here in in chapter 9 try to rekindle that awareness. Um, There's some things that they do here in these first five verses that I think today the church can learn from. I think that we can look at these first five verses in chapter 9 and say, okay, let me go ahead and Let me go ahead and view them like this was a reality TV show. Let let me just watch what these people are doing and see if I can grab some principles off of their worship, out of their life, out of their decisions that maybe we could apply in our own lives. So we enter into a new season. Every every fall, every August up is a is a new day. It's a new school year, right? It's it's people coming back and starting a new season at work somewhere. It's summertime has completed, it's, it's time to lean in to whatever is next, and I think there's some things that we can apply. It's fitting that we, we find ourselves in Nehemiah chapter 9 here today. Let me look at the first part of verse 1. It says, now on the, the 24th day of this month, the people of Israel were assembled with, with fasting and in sackcloth 
and with earth on their heads. Can I just say, it's okay to sometimes read the Bible and think, that sounds weird. All right? Anybody else? Maybe y'all just do this every day. Okay, I don't know. I read that verse and I think, that's weird. And I allow weirdness to drive me deeper into context. Amen? There's always more that we can learn. There's always more that we can uncover. There's always more that we can say, okay, God, let me read it again. Let me look at it again. You know what? Let me pray, and then let me read it again. I stood, let me pray, and let me look again, and let me do some research, and let me try to understand what was happening in this time period. What's interesting about Nehemiah chapter 9 is it's a continuation from what God has been doing in chapters 7 and 8. So Nehemiah is this man of God who, who gets this God dream. One of the phrases we've been using throughout this journey through the book of Nehemiah is, as you see here on the wall, just go for it. Somebody say, just go for it. The reason why I love that phrase, just go for it, is because Nehemiah, who's, who's living in a pagan land, serving a, a, a pagan king, somebody who doesn't believe in the God of the Bible, who doesn't believe in Yahweh, right? we see this king doing the opposite, but Nehemiah has been positioned, just like some of you teachers have been positioned at your school to be a leader to live with integrity, to live with character. And he gets promoted to be the cupbearer to the king. And one day, he hears this bad news about what's happened in Israel. What's happened in Israel? Well, walls have been torn down. Gates have been burned. People have been exiled. A place that was once known as the Holy Land, containing the holy people, is now gone. Desolate, ran by leaders who don't believe in God. Bibles have been put away. And the land has been torn down to pieces. Nehemiah hears this report and gets a God dream and says, God, would you send me? God, send me back to my hometown to be a restorer, to be a rebuilder, to to plant something, to change something, to rebuild. And God begins to give him favor. I believe that God blesses faith that's willing to take a step. Amen. Faith that's willing to even take a risk. Like, could Nehemiah have been killed just by by the request alone? Yes. He's the cupbearer to the king. He's supposed to be there looking out for the king, and not just anybody can do that. But because of the favor of God in his life, he makes this request. He prays and asks God to bless. And the king actually says to him, how how much time do you need? How much money do you need? Here's some papers where I'll advocate for you. Go do the work. Nehemiah goes and does the work. Chapters 1 through 7, you can see him working, literally working on the wall, hammer in one hand, a sword in another hand, doing the work. He builds a team. God provides him with the right people. Opposition strikes, but Nehemiah continues. This should be like a movie right here. Come on, right? Right? And he he does the work, and finally, you'll find that the, the wall is built. So what happens is they rebuild this beautiful wall. The people of God begin to make their way back to their hometown. They begin to fill the place. In Nehemiah chapter 7, he begins to take role. He says, is you, are you here? Are you here? Some of y'all students are going to go to class tomorrow. The teacher's going to say your name. You'll be like, present, right? I'm here. This was the moment where Nehemiah does that. You can find all of those beautiful names in chapters 7 and 8, right? And there... Nehemiah says, okay, if we're going to restart this thing, we got to start it right. we got to start with God, amen? Um, to, to put him first, like Pastor Joshua shared, to, to put him as the center, like Kelly just shared, that, that this has to be a God-centered place filled with God-centered people. And so Nehemiah starts a worship service in chapter 8. And what he does is he pulls out the word of God, he opens it up, and everybody begins to weep. A brokenness fills the land. And Nehemiah says, we need to repent of our past sin. But then somebody realizes, wait, 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 wait. Nehemiah, actually the calendar says, this is a time of celebration. So Nehemiah says, everybody, wait, 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 don't weep. We're actually supposed to be celebrating. I I forgot what day it is. And so Nehemiah says, cancel the tears for a second. Let's actually get a feast going. In Nehemiah chapter 8, they have this amazing, joyful, the joy of the Lord is your strength party and celebration, the Feast of of Booths. And that's where we last left off before the summer. 
Chapter 9, now on the 24th day of this month, Nehemiah realizes, all right, now back to the weeping. Where were we? We were, we were going somewhere. I want us to take a step back toward that. Now on the 24th day of the month, many scholars believe this was October 31st. This was right around the Day of Atonement, a day to look up to God and get right with God. And, and he says, on this month, the people of Israel were assembled with fasting and in sackcloth, and and with earth on their heads. This this idea of of fasting is interesting to me, that that Nehemiah says, you know what, this new season, this new day, this restart, they hit the reset button, they rebuilt this wall, God did so many miracles to see it happen. Nehemiah says, I want us to to start with with fasting. And I I was thinking about the topic of, of, of fasting because... Prayer and fasting work so well together, and they do something in us that draws us closer to Jesus like, like no other. And God gave me a revelation just recently while I was on vacation. Can I share it with you? Yeah. So my family and I went and visited a water park called Great Wolf Lodge. I don't know if you've ever been there. I just heard about it, and we need one of those in Vegas because it gets hot, amen? Amen. And so we're in Anaheim, California. We're at the Great Wolf Lodge, and I'm there with my four sons and Nina, and we're having a great time at the water park. And suddenly, my seven-year-old Epaph discovers this amazing concept. What is it? It's the Lazy River. <laughs> Do we got any Lazy River fans in the room? Come on, don't, don't be ashamed. It's okay. And so we're, we're going around this Lazy River, and here's Here's kind of a picture of it. And Epaph loves the lazy river. The lazy river is this kind of long, windy, wavy river that just continues to take you around and around. And if you're lucky enough or blessed enough, you get a raft and then you can sit in it and it just takes you with the current. And so we're in the lazy river and we're going around and around and around and around. And I'm like, okay. I'm kind of lazy rivered out, and Epaph's just loving it. He's just going with it. He's like running through it, like a little speedster, right? And finally, I realized, you know what? It's time to get out of the lazy river. And I realized, as I missed the first exit, it just kind of took me through. I was like, hold on, i got to be strategic on the next exit. And the current just kind of takes you past the little stairs, so I did one of those, uh, grabbed the rail, pulled myself up. And I got out of the, the lazy river. And I grabbed Epaph as he came by. Where? Come on back here. And I pulled him out of the current of the lazy river. And we went into something else. And I felt like the Holy Spirit gave me something in that moment. Because I believe that if you're not careful, you can find yourself in the lazy river of Christianity. Going around and around, and around, and you get into the current of this is just what we do, I'm on the lazy river of, hey, what's God showed you recently? Ah, you know, I I, I got saved when I was eight. You're 28. God's still speaking. What's God shown you this year? What's God doing with you now? What are you repenting of now? What are you drawing closer to now? What are you reading now? Or are you on the lazy river? Do you know how to do church? Or are you the church? Be careful that you don't get on the lazy... You don't get in a raft here at Walk Church. You got your seat. You got your coffee. The church starts to become something for... I don't really like this song. Does it matter what you like? Or does it matter who we sing to? Right? Not that it... Yes, of course it matters. Don't get offended. Don't be like, man, pastor said I don't matter. You matter. Trust me, you, you, Jesus died for you, you matter. But friend, I want to encourage you to be careful that you don't get stuck on the lazy river of culture, the lazy river of life, the lazy river of even faith. When we have a creative, big, huge God, now how do you get out of the lazy river? Let me tell you how. Come on, somebody lean in with me. I believe fasting gets you out of the lazy river. I believe prayer, coupled with biblical fasting, is the handlebar to get you back 
into a state of focus that you need to be in in order to break the current of the lazy river. I want to preach a message to you this morning that I'm titling, Get Out of the Lazy River. Come on, amen. Can I just speak that to somebody? (laughs) Tap them next to you. Tap them next to you so they don't get mad at me and say, hey, friend, 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 get out of the lazy river. Come on, get out of the lazy river. Come on, tell the person on the other side. Tell them, say, don't be lazy. Don't be lazy. Get out of the lazy river. Get out of the, come on, online, put it in the chat. Get out of the lazy river. Get out of the lazy river. I believe that Nehemiah is trying to get the people of God to get out of the lazy river. And it's so neat that he would even return to his initial desire. Like, had God ever spoken something to you and you just knew it in the moment? You're like, oh, man, I need to do this, but I'm actually busy right now at work and I can't really do that right now. Uh, Maybe God will forget about it. Maybe I'll forget about it. (laughs) No, no. Maybe you've been in a conversation before and you're like, I shouldn't have said that, but I can't really just, I can't make it right right now because, you know, the bill is coming. I got to pay, you know, and you're like, okay. And Nehemiah's like, I'm going to get back to that. I'm going to put a pin in it. God's doing something. I got to get out of the lazy river. And Nehemiah gives us some cues here on just how to do it. I have a bunch of points. I don't know if we'll get into all the points here today, but guess what? Come on. This is good reason to come back next week. Right? If we just, if we get a little far here today, let's, let's just keep building on it next week. And let's get out of the lazy river together. I believe God is taking our church into a new season. That the season of 2022, the fall season of 22, is an opportunity to get out of the lazy river. To go into, come on, check this out. You know what I told Epaph? There's other rides. There's other slides. There's bigger and better stuff than the lazy river. Oh, Christian, hear me. God has more for you. There's bigger and better stuff than just what you're doing right now. If you would allow yourself, you might be able to hear God clearer. You you might actually receive a calling from the Lord to do something bigger than you even realized was on your life. You thought you were meant for the lazy river. (laughs) What if God had something bigger all along? What if if you got out, you realized, oh, there's a whole big old slide right there that God wanted me to experience. Step out of the lazy river. We talk, we see here in the text, fasting. One of, the, one of the ways to get out of the lazy river is biblical fasting, for my note takers. Biblical fasting. Now, I didn't hear an amen on that point. I wouldn't have amen my own point. I struggle with fasting. But love, hate, relationship with biblical fasting. And the reason why I say biblical fasting, because biblical fasting is different than just fasting. I, in fact, I, I feel like in the, in the culture we live in today, like fasting is kind of become popular, but you know, new agers are fasting, and you got people doing their intermittent fast, and you got people doing all types of different fasting, which is more so dieting in an intentional way. I'm talking about biblical fasting that has a purpose tied to it. Biblical fasting has to do with you and God. It has to do with discipline, and it has to do with faith. One fasting is actually just dieting. I struggle with that one too. Biblical fasting is purpose-filled. Biblical fasting, I love what Donald Whitney says as he writes in his book on spiritual disciplines. He says, fasting does not change God's hearing so much as it changes our praying. Right? Fasting, it does something in us to, to make us hunger more for God than we did before. And so that's why I'm excited to announce to you that in two weeks, everybody say two weeks, because you need time to prepare. People are like, man, I need to, Pastor Hyde, I need time to prepare for this. And I feel you, because there's probably some sweets that you want to eat over the next two weeks. And I ain't mad at you. Invite me. That in two weeks, we're going to be entering into a season of 21 days of prayer and fasting. Amen? Amen. Did anybody just get excited or was it just like three of y'all holy people? And come on, I'm excited. 21 days of prayer and fast. It's starting on August 21st. It's going all the way to September 10th. 
And one of the ways to get out of the lazy river is to take this invitation. Oh, brother, sister, I want to invite you to go on this journey with us. Over the next two weeks, we're going to be talking more about prayer and fasting. We're actually going to have a devotional guide that's going to go with the 21 days that I'm writing. There's going to be an intentional prayer focus over those 21 days that's really going to help you get out of the lazy river. This is what's happening in Nehemiah 9. Nehemiah is saying, we can't go backwards. History repeats itself. We will end up right where we came from if we're not careful. We need to do this the God way. Here's what fasting does. Let me give you three points for my note takers. If you want, just take a picture of this. Maybe you'll revisit it. We'll post it as well. Biblical fasting disconnects us from the world and reconnects us with God. Anybody need a better reconnection? Maybe you're like, you know what? I once was connected. Now I kind of don't feel as connected. Come on. Biblical fasting can help you do that. Biblical fasting says no to the temporary to say yes to the eternal. Saying, you know what? I'm going to say no even to a specific food or type of food to say yes to an eternal God. I'm going to ask the Lord to replace my hunger and desire for one thing and change it to a hunger and desire for another thing. In this case, him, biblical fasting breaks the current of the lazy river. I'm praying that during those 21 days, God de- deposits something in you that you go, whoa, I needed that. That was different than the lazy river. I, I-, I want that. Something I also want to encourage you with on the co- in the context of of. 21 days of prayer and fasting is what we do oftentimes here at Walk Church. At least twice a year, we do this thing called 24-hour day of prayer. 24 hours of prayer. Held at our walk office. It's happening on Wednesday, September 7th. Going all the way to Thursday, September 8th. Can I just challenge you to commit Okay, amen. Praise God. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just putting it out there. I'm just putting the menu out there, all right? You've got to decide what you want to order. But here's what I know. I'm not staying in the lazy river this year. I hope you'll come with me. I can't. God has too much more in store for me, and you never know what tomorrow holds. I, I want to go to the next level in my walk with Jesus. Not to earn salvation. You couldn't run enough to earn it. But because God is worthy and God is good and you need it. We're all drifters. Y'all know what I'm talking about? We're either drifting into sin or we're drifting closer to him. Where are you at here here today? To to be intentional, I want to encourage you to mark your calendar. We're going to. We're going to be sharing all this in our weekly email, Church Life. We're going to be putting this on social media. So don't, don't worry if you don't get all the context and content right now. But we're doing 24 hours of prayer. We're also going to do 21 days of prayer and fasting with intentional focus. Friends, we got to get out of the lazy river. You might still be in the summer, but the summer's over. God wants to take us somewhere. The other thing that I want to encourage and I want to challenge you with here today, and I'm using that word challenge in an intentional way, is every Wednesday. Somebody say every Wednesday. Every Wednesday. Oh, say it like you mean. Say every Wednesday. Every Wednesday we have a prayer gathering. Every Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. at our walk office. You can also stream on YouTube and Facebook. We have a prayer meeting. I want to make sure everybody sees me. Let me see your eyes just for a minute. Don't feel uncomfortable. I'm, 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 I'm challenging you to be there. I'm asking you to make time. You make time for whatever you want to make time for. If you want to make time for your son's baseball game, you'll do it. I got a seven-year-old, and I'm realizing that's a real thing. <laughs> if you want to make time to hang out with your friends, you'll do it. If you want to make time to watch your favorite sports team, come on, you'll do it. Here's what I know about us Americans. We do what we want. I'm asking you. I'm challenging you. I've never left one of these Wednesday prayer meetings thinking, man, I'm, I wish I didn't go. 
I always think there's actually more we need to pray for. And we met with the Lord. Like, we, I'm, I'm dreaming of a day that Wednesday nights are standing, or you have to get on the waiting list to get in to our walk office. I, I find that myself too often am praying for empty chairs. I'm like at the prayer meeting, like, where is everybody? Where's our hunger, church? We need to, we, we need to get out of the lazy river. We, we as a church don't pray well. We, we pray, but I don't know that we pray well. Because, as Charles Spurgeon once accurately said, he said, you can gauge a church's spirituality based upon who attends their prayer meeting. And I sometimes get here on Sunday, and I think, man, our church is, I love these people, and I do, and I'm grateful for what God's doing on Sunday. But I'm curious to really understand, is the power actually on Wednesday? And I know this may go over a lot of your heads because you're doing what you want to do on Wednesday. I'm asking you to make time. I'm asking you to rearrange your schedule. Why? To get out of the lazy river. It's up to you. But hey, why not? (laughs) Amen? Why not? Here's what I had to reckon with in my own heart. Is there something more important for me than praying with my church family every week? I realized, you know what? I can't justify it. Now, I don't want anybody to feel any sense of condemnation because, listen, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Don't feel heavy or burdened here today because that's not what Jesus is looking for. He's not looking for dutiful prayer. That's religion. That, that doesn't go anywhere. Those prayers stop at the ceiling. But he's looking for delight. He's looking for children who want to spend time with him. He's looking for those who, who are hungry and disciplined. I'm challenging you to be there Wednesday. I'm, I'm students, high school students, middle school students. Grow and cultivate a hunger for God now. Kids, tell your parents, I want to go to prayer night. (laughs) Parents, tell your kids, we're going to pray. We're going to go pray. Jump online if you need to jump online. If you're watching this from another city or state, there's a lot of people from different places that tune in with us every week. Oh, friend, if you want to break the lazy river, show up on Wednesday. Not just every once in a while. Every Wednesday. Let's do it. Somebody say, let's do it. It's one of the ways to break the the cycle. It says, now on the 24th day of this month, the people of Israel were assembled with fasting and in in sackcloth. Let me give you the second point. One of the second ways to break the lazy river current is through humbling yourself. Can I just say that? Humbling yourself. This is starting to feel like one of those sermons that's like, ouch! Ouch! But sometimes the ouch sermons make you draw near to God, amen? Come on, I don't want to just itch your back. I want you to grow deeper with Christ. Biblical fasting, you know, one of the ways to humble yourself is through biblical fasting. (laughs) Another way to humble yourself is is by recognizing, you know what, God, I'm not that great. I'm actually deeply sinful. I'm trapped in a shell that's sinful. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Like you're, like you're, like, like you're saved, you've repented of your sins, and, and you're following Jesus, but your body doesn't know that. Your body is still programmed. That's why we, get, we need a new body. Our body is still trying to catch up to what happened in our souls. So our bodies, that's why Paul says, every day I have to crucify the flesh. And he wasn't talking about Jumping up on the cross, Jesus did that for us. He was talking about denying the flesh. The flesh is, as Pastor Mike preached last week, working against the spirit. 
Humble yourself. Here's what he says in verse 1, chapter 9. Now on the 24th day of this month, the people of Israel were assembled with, with fasting and, and sackcloth. Now, what is sackcloth? I'm going to give you a deep definition. It's the cloth that makes the sack. <laughs> All right. Maybe you've seen one of those sack races. We had our 412 field day not too long ago. We did an awesome sack race. These things don't feel good. Can I get an amen? amen? The people of Israel are intentionally grabbing the stuff that doesn't feel good, putting it on themselves because they want to feel the brokenness. They want to feel grieving. They want to feel humble. The purpose of fasting and sackcloth is to to say no to the flesh and to actually humble yourself to say, I need God. By putting on sack, I'm not saying that we need to, to, to do that. I'm trying to show you that their outward sign matched their inward desperation. Does that make sense? It says that they, they put earth on their head. They put dust on their head. Sometimes you'll see the phrase sackcloth and ashes. What's the purpose of putting dust, earth, dirt on your head. Kind of weird. Amen. You know why they did that? They did that as an outward expression to show God that he's God and they're not. Maybe you, maybe you can recall this verse out of the book of Genesis. In Genesis chapter 2, where God is creating. It says, then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground. Can I just say today that you are a big ball of dust (laughs) that is made by the Lord that has some makeup or cologne on? (laughs) In other words, oh, this is going to hurt. You're not that special. You're not. I'm not. This guy is not. You're not. And so... Here's how you get out of the lazy river. They're saying, hey, we got to remember that we're just dust. In a single moment, God could go like this. And you're gone. 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 The best thing you can do is get to a place of humility and say, oh, man. Whoa. I'm that. And this is God. I got to get right with him. I got to come to him. And I'm grateful for what Joshua shared earlier, that Jesus gives us the access to get to God. That we can go through Christ to be in a right relationship with God. He is the mediator between man and holy God. So what's the purpose of the sackcloth and the earth on the head? Sackcloth is to say, you know what, this is uncomfortable. My sin is uncomfortable. The earth on the head is to say, I'm just dust. God, God this, is their, this is their moment of prayer to the Lord. They, they want to demonstrate brokenness. I think it's foreign to us. We hear a sermon like this, and it doesn't make sense because we're so comfortable. It, it doesn't make, this doesn't make sense to us because we have everything we need, amen, and more. Is anybody else's closet bursting at the seams? Does anybody else have a lot of stuff in there? A refrigerator, if you don't and are in need, come to us so we can help you because we have a lot to give. We, we live in a culture where we are consumed by scrolling on a screen. Get out of the lazy river. We're consumed by TV. We're consumed by stuff. And the thing that I value about Nehemiah chapter 9 verse 1 is that they... So you know what? We have to radically do something different. Look at verse 1 with me one more time, and we'll close the sermon up here today. It says that on the 24th day, they made a decision through fasting and through prayer. Through sackcloth and through putting earth on their heads, they, they made a decision to to get out of the lazy river. The text continues, and the Israelites separated themselves from all 
foreigners. That, that'll be the last one that I touch on. I'll, just, I'll touch on it briefly, and then we'll close up our service for uh, today. Can I just give you the third one? Third and, third and final point, and then we'll pick it up the next half. They separated themselves. If you want to get out of Lazy River, biblical fasting, humble yourself, separate yourself. Again, deep topics here, but I'm, I'm, I'm excited about going to the next place with God. I'm excited about it. Ooh, it makes me pumped up. Some of you need to separate yourself. What did the the Israelites do? Nehemiah challenged the people. Ezra stood up and read and challenged the people to separate themselves from things that were foreign to God, including people. As I read that context, there were people who had relationships with people that were hindering their walk with Jesus instead of helping their walk with Jesus, and Nehemiah asked them to separate. Is that crazy? Or is it biblical? Let me give you this verse, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Are we reading the same Bible anymore? What partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? What fellowship has light with, with darkness? I don't know what you need to separate yourself from, but maybe you need to separate yourself from something. It might even be your phone. It might be a specific group of people that are toxic. You might have to get comfortable with that unfollow button. Or maybe you need to just tell somebody that you're in a relationship with, I can no longer be in a relationship with you because I got to get out of the lazy river. (laughs) And that might not make sense. But we trust him, don't we? Now, really quick, I got to give my disclaimer, and then I'm praying out. For all the married couples in the room that are like, okay, I know what to do now. I know what I need to do. I've been waiting for this sermon. You already made the wrong choice. I'm just playing. (laughs) The the Bible would, would, would encourage you in your marriage to be the example. Be the light. Be the standard. This is not a license for divorce. This is a guide to help you not make the wrong decision ahead of time. This is a... Because Paul would tell you in in the same books to the Corinthians, he would say, if you're in a marriage with an unbeliever, stay. Stay and love that person like Christ loves you. And be the light and pray for your spouse and intercede for them and love your wife like Christ loves the church and respect your husband like the church respects Christ and and live those principles and trust God to do the rest that maybe your husband would be saved by seeing your godly conduct that maybe your wife would come to know Jesus because she met Jesus through you but Outside of the marriage relationship, hey, friend, I just want to encourage you. You heard it first from Pastor Hyde and do what you've got to do to get out of the lazy river. If you've got to separate yourself from some things, if you've got to stop going to that club, if you have to say no to sin to say yes to him, do it. Pull yourself out, amen? Pull yourself out. Thank you, Jesus, for pulling us out. Thank you for this day. This is the day that you've made. Lord, we trust you. God, we honor you. And we worship you. And if there's somebody here today, there's somebody in this room today that needs to get saved. Lord, I pray that they would cry out to you. They would fall on their knees today and say, Jesus, save me. And we thank you that your blood is available to save. That you've died the death that we deserved You rose from the grave that we would stay dead in. You have finished the race. And you have invited us with grace. So Holy Spirit, have your way. Break the cycles, Lord. Help us to get out of the lazy river. That's you right now. Would you just lift your hand if you just feel like you need to take a step toward Jesus this morning? 
Father, I pray for all the hands lifted online and in the, in the room. Holy Spirit, flood into these people's lives. Do what you do. You can call upon his name right now. Just say, Jesus, save me. Jesus, change me. Give me the discipline. Give me the strength. I'll follow you all my days. Believe you died and rose. Coming again. In Jesus' name. Amen.